right, I'd like to call the committee of the whole meeting for Monday, June 6, 2022 to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Gafino. Here. Trustee Carroll. Here. Trustee Lowry. Here. Trustee Nedgevich. Here. Trustee Salazar. Here. All right, thank you. Audience comments? Trustee comments? Uh, discussion on um, number one, Steve. Thank you. Item number one is uh, amendments to municipal code, and these are for electronic amusement devices and the liquor code. Um, in the administration department, we handle certain types of fees and registrations annually. Uh, one of those is electronic amusement devices. It, it quite frankly, can be confusing. And um, it's one of those things where the staff has asked me to look at removing them because it's not necessarily the most business friendly thing as well. And to go into a little bit, we only have a, a few uh, agencies in town that actually have electronic devices that fall in the category. There's some confusion on what's electronic uh, device and what's not. The simple fact is like you look at it like something where if you read the, uh, the definition here, it says an electronic device utilizing a television like screen, which upon insertion of a coin slug token plate or disc or any payment of any other consideration may be operated by the public generally as a game entertainment or amusement, whether or not registering a score. That's the definition for an electronic device. So to put that plainly, what creates confusion is if it's an arcade game, it's an electronic device. If it's a claw machine game, it's not, but it's still an entertainment game. So we go through this every year with the, the places that have it, what machines you have, which don't you have. And the whole thing generates, I think there's three businesses that have them and it generates a total in revenue of only $1,425 for the village. Uh, so it's one of those things where the staff is saying it takes more time to regulate it, go after everybody. And, and, and it's just not a lot of time and effort goes into pulling in $1,400 worth of revenue. On the flip side of that, it also is the question of, okay, an electronic amusement device is an arcade game, but a claw machine is an arcade game, but we don't regulate that. So what makes that any different? You know, For the same amount of money you're putting in a machine, why is this one regulated and this one's not? Video gaming terminals are tied into that, but they're actually governed separately by a different fee and regulation structure. So what we're trying to do is do two things, eliminate electronic amusement devices, and basically say, if you want arcade games as of right now, don't, you don't need a license from us. It's 25, 50, or $100 per machine, depending on how many you have up to 10. After 10, you have to get special permission. So if you, if you actually wanted to open an arcade right now, you'd have to come back. And, and actually get permission from the village and figure out a fee structure because our code says anything after 10 needs special approval. So what we're looking to do is get rid of electronic amusement devices in its totality, but then separately look at video gaming terminals tonight and look at the way we do our, our video game gambling machines. In that regard, uh, as, as most of you, we went through it tonight, no, we have a $500 a year supplemental video gaming license. Each machine by code, we can charge $25 a machine annually. That's because years ago, that's what the state law set as a maximum per machine for non-home rural entities like the village. Uh, is, is it $25 or $250? So it's $25 currently. Oh. So what it is, is basically by law, you can have up to six gambling machines. So $150 is all you'd have to register those five machines, or excuse me, six machines, $150. And then our total liquor license is $500. And it includes the registration of your machines. So in essence, the, the license is like $350. The machines can be up $150, and that's what makes up your $500. What the staff is looking at is removing the electronic amusement devices. Does the board also want to look at the video gaming machines because the state law has recently changed and now we can charge up to $250 per video gaming machine, um, which obviously would then equate to $1,500 an establishment for video gaming machines. So what we put together, and it doesn't mean that we can't change the numbers, but what we have in front of you tonight with a draft ordinance is keeping the video gaming license fee at $500 annually to be approved by the board so you can have video gaming at your establishment and then charging $250 per machine. So essentially the village 
would be uh, generating $500 to $2,000 in establishment um, for video gaming purposes. I like that idea. I do too. I read through it, Steve, and I thought it made a lot of good common sense yep. for, for the uh, benefit of the community village here. When, when would it go into effect? Would it go into effect immediately or uh, so like, like we got these two pending that we just approved today? I'm assuming it would yeah. kick in after that. So what we could do is we could do two things. Sometimes ordinance go in effect immediately and sometimes we can set the date. And I think the general thought was we could do this starting next um, liquor license year. Um, but if the board wants to start that sooner, because liquor licenses are due March 1, we send out renewals typically by end of January, early February. So we could wait that long or we could do that right now. I mean, anyone who has to come in for a supplemental video game license has to go through our new process. So it really doesn't matter. If you wanted to set that right now, you could. Okay. So could we do something, Steve, where if they were a new applicant, we could charge it from this point forward and those that are just coming up for a renewal not do that until March, maybe? So in our code for liquor licenses, we actually do prorate liquor licenses oh, okay. based on when you come in. I believe it's every quarter. So, But then would you prorate the, the fees for the... It's something on the supplemental. I, we hadn't discussed prorating it. Um, okay. The idea being that video gaming is so regulated and that the board has had a, a number of conversations recently on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, this is really for feedback. So I don't think we had any intention of prorating it. The current process is that anytime you come in, it's a supplemental license. Mm -hmm. We typically don't prorate supplemental licenses. Um, so that was the thought it was just leave it as a supplemental and then just start it whenever the board is comfortable starting it. Do we, do we have any idea how much revenue is generated in the village by the video gaming? Uh, yeah, actually, Jason, do you have those numbers in front of you? So in total, it's roughly 120,000 and it, it really varies by establishment. I mean, some are as low as 5,000, some can be up in the 40,000. So it's really, it varies between where we're talking, but in total about 120,000. I mean, if you have, uh, an establishment that the video gaming is the only thing keep, keeping them alive. I mean, that's what the market's for, right? <laughs> is to weed those out. But also we want to keep as much variety in the village and stay competitive. But if we're going to charge $2,000 and it's as low as $4,000, you're taking half of their revenue away from them annually. Uh so that's just the money that the village generates. And we only oh. generate, yeah. Um, yeah. I believe yeah. it's 5% of the total uh, revenue they generate. Okay. I think what Jason was alluding to, uh, so the way it, and it, the law changed a, a little while ago. So the breakdown isn't a hundred percent the same it was when the law first came out, but it's essentially, um, a third goes to the operator of the machines, a third goes to the establishments, a third goes to the taxes. And of those taxes, we get a small portion the state keeps the rest. Um, I, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it. I'm good with it. I, I guess maybe, I just wanna be clear. So let's just say someone came in in November or December and they paid the 500 and then the $250 per machine. And then the liquor licenses, do they, do they renew on the anniversary or they all renew in March? Yeah, so right now, like I said, with a supplemental, it'd be like if someone came in for, and I know it's a much different dollar amount, but if someone came in for uh, an outdoor event mm -hmm. and it's 50 or $100, depending on the number of days, they could do that a week before renewals. It's a supplemental. So we, we haven't really prorated supplementals. If someone's coming in for a $2,000 liquor license, an annual year long liquor license for their category that they belong to, um, we prorate that based on how many months into the year uh, at different times. So my suggestion is if, if the board is uh, concerned that, you know, this is a, a steep jump in, in the price for video gaming, then you don't have to do anything now. We can write the ordinance so that it doesn't go into effect until the new uh, cycle starts, which is uh, March 1 of next year. I, I'd rather have it prorated, I think because uh, we'll, I mean, we just added two. 
I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. We prorate the regular license, right? So yeah, the regular license. Yeah. So, so why not prorate, prorate this? Some that makes sense, I think. It's fair. Yeah. And as of right now, I mean, we don't know any, uh, to my knowledge, in the pipeline, so to speak, that are, you know, off the top of my head, that are looking to come in. Um, so let's say, for example, the two that we just approved, right? Tracy's and a world of bolts. Mm -hmm. So would they be affected? No, because yeah. the earliest this would go into effect is we'd still have to take this back to the village board on June 20th. Okay. So they got their approvals tonight. And so, I mean, Kevin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, they'd be under the current fee structure because we approve them under the current fee structure. So when they go to renew, then they will be under that, but not until that time. Everybody would be under that. And anytime we change the liquor code, so we, we updated our liquor code a couple of years ago. And when the renewals go out, there is a letter that kind of tells you what happened if things changed. Um, we've upped you know, some categories, a couple hundred dollars. Hey, this is what happened and this is why. Mm -hmm. And they know that when they renew. Okay, thank you. And I'm good removing the amusement device tax too. <clears throat> hey, Steve, any idea yeah. how uh, surrounding towns d deal with this or do they charge the same? Have you looked into that at all? Uh, it depends. Cause if you're, once again, you if said you're, it's new. What makes it difficult is the fact that we're not home rule because we were already capped at 25. So the home rule communities, they could be charging a lot more already. If, and, and I know, you know, I've heard some towns have. So we've always kept at 25 just because. But it is funny that in theory, you could have a video gaming <clears throat> machine that was $25, but based on our electronic amusement device, you could have, if you had 10 machines or nine machines at your establishment for arcade game, you'd have to pay $100 for, you know, an arcade game. You're paying more. Yeah. Right, $100 yeah. for an arcade game, but we're charging only 25 for a video gaming terminal. Right. That generates a yeah. ton of revenue. Yeah. All right, so we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just a recap, so we're good. I have the supplemental uh, goes into effect as soon as approved. Mm -hmm. I have um, the electronic, Amusement devices is okay to remove from the code. And it was prorated. Yep. The supplemental yes. be prorated. Oh, prorate to supplemental? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, as like you do with the liquor license. So prorate supplemental for the this year goes into the full fee goes into effect March 1. Okay. Right. Well, I think that would mean anytime, even if it's two years from now, somebody comes halfway through the, the season, they're only going to pay half we're prorating it aren't we doing that every year Isn't not just... with supplementals only with the actual but, category liquor licenses that's what we just talked about though i thought yeah but you want to do the supplemental don't we yes, yes. permanently do you want to permanently prorate the supplemental yes as well? okay. right Correct. What's the alternative that they would pay a full fee yes. for a month left of a yes of a yeah. oh yeah yeah I would say prorated right? yeah and we don't like I said we don't have a lot of liquor licenses that have um, that type of fee associated with them yeah. they're generally small okay That's good then prorated mm -hmm. okay. all right thank you item two Steve. Item number two is regarding Park 88 Logistics. Uh, this is a warehouse development off of Sullivan, uh, just to the south of Smoke Tree Plaza. Um, it went to the Planning Commission, and Mike is going to take us through a presentation. He is looking for your feedback on whether or not to move this forward uh, to the Village Board. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, we got petition 22-03. Uh, um, this might look familiar to some of you. They came to the Community of the Whole twice last year. Um, Steve mentioned the property location. Uh, we're going to go ahead and let the developer present the information with regard to the development. Then at the end, I'll go through a brief presentation and kind of give an overview of what's being requested of the village this time. So uh, if someone wants to come up and go ahead and start the presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, my name is Jess Kennedy. I'm with Phelan Development. Uh, we're the petitioner and proposed developer for uh, Park 88 Logistics Center. Um, we are actually new to the committee. Um, we are the, the prior developer, I guess, uh, they, they did not proceed with the project. Um, we have spent a fair amount of time trying to solve some of the challenges that, that I think they encountered initially. Um, we've been meeting with, with Mike and the team, 
uh, since October of last year and, uh, and sat down and, and tried to solve some of the, the challenges with this site. Um, it has sat vacant as kind of non-productive land for quite some time. Uh, it is identified in the, uh, the Village of North Aurora's comprehensive plan as a potential office and industrial use. Um, we are looking to develop uh, two buildings on the site of office and warehouse nature uh, with access at Sullivan Road, as well as Smoke Tree Plaza. And part of the, part of the uh, solution that we looked to solve for was some of the, the ingress and egress of getting both the vehicular and, uh, and truck traffic in and out of the site. Um, we did come up with some creative solutions uh, through a uh, four unique cellar assemblage that allowed us some additional frontage on Sullivan Road to allow for full maneuvering of, uh, of trucks in and out of the site, where at the, I think the prior developer was having some challenges with the, uh, the, the 40 foot right of way that was, that was originally uh, sitting there on Fairview Drive. Um, we are, we're planning to construct uh, two, two buildings totaling 430,000 square feet. Um, we come to you tonight uh, requesting a special use uh, ORI light industrial uh, with um, uh, site plan approval and, and Plata subdivision. Uh, this is our, our concept site plan. Uh, we've presented this to plan commission. Um, it has been scrubbed extensively uh, with Mike uh, and his team. And I think we've, we've done a really good job uh, looking at the adjacent uses. Um, and we have, we have a fair amount of different uses around the site. Uh, and how we, how we try and mitigate any uh, negative impacts from, from this type of use. Uh, we have met with some of the neighboring uh, businesses, some of which are actually selling us uh, a couple of the, the parcels. Uh, and we've also met with the IBEW uh, folks to our, our Southwest. Um, and they were very supportive of the project uh, because we'll be utilizing a lot of their, their local uh, union electricians for the project as well. Uh, the facilities uh, planned, Building A, which is planned south, um, would be a 36-foot clear, 263,000 square foot facility. Uh, we would plan on multi-tenant. This would be set up with two unique storefronts at the corners uh, for offices uh, with a potential planned future uh, office in the center. Uh, building B um, to the plan north is a, planned to be 166,000 square feet, 32-foot clear, um, and we would plan for that to be up to four customers. We'd have two corner entries as well as two unique uh, storefront entries towards the center of the facility so that we can accommodate a myriad of use sizes um, and different types of uses in the facility. We've concentrated the loading and trailer parking to the center of the site, uh, using the buildings as natural um, sound attenuating and also for visual screening of, of the trucks and the maneuvering. Uh, we've located the vehicular tra uh, traffic to the outer rings of both of the buildings where uh, truck traffic will be prohibited. Um, and then we also have allowed for the trucks to get in off of Fairview um, and into the truck courts and into their, their loading bursts as, as quickly as possible. Uh, vehicular traffic can, can egress the site to the north on Smoke Tree and, and exit out onto 31 at the, uh, the Cinem Cinemark uh, Tinseltown uh, intersection. We have planned for full uh, access along Sullivan. Uh, part of our uh, assemblage of one of the parcels uh, adjacent to the right-of-way has allowed for us to, to, to allow for proper maneuvering both inbound and, and outbound from, the, from that uh, curb cut. Uh, we're currently working with the city of Aurora. They are the authority having jurisdiction over Sullivan. Uh, that was done through, I think, an interagency agreement with you guys, I think in the maybe the 90s. Uh, so we, we are anticipating receiving comments from them tomorrow. Uh, their village engineer was endeavoring to get it to us today prior to, to meeting with you all, uh, but they unfortunately needed to complete an internal review. So as soon as we have the results from their initial comments, we'll share those with, with Mike. Uh, and, and your team so that uh, we can have a collaborative uh, review of how we're looking at that, that uh, the improvements uh, at that location. Maybe the next plan, Mike. So this, this gives you maybe a better depiction of how the site will function. Um, we have uh, Boulevard 
uh, access off of Sullivan. Uh, it'll be tree-lined and have a, a nice, nice park entrance. Um, we also have some adjacency to a couple residential lots in the southeast corner, uh, which is kind of bottom left. Uh, we'll provide a fair amount of opaque screening, both with landscaping as well as uh, an opaque fence. Uh, and we also were conscious of trying to keep the, the building as far away from that, that property line as possible. There is a natural bifurcation of our site from those neighboring lots. Uh, there is a, um, a drainage swale that runs through that area. Uh, and it's pretty heavily wooded to the south of us as well. Um, to our north, uh, the, we have a couple of detention ponds planned. Um, the adjacency to our north is the, uh, the hotel. They are actually uh, one of the sellers. They're selling some of their unproductive land um, just to their west to us that gives us the curb cut and access to Smoke Tree Plaza. And then we also have located a detention pond um, in between the, the two dedicated trailer uh, parking areas on our site. Uh, the site will be uh, landscaped with native plantings. Um, we will look to utilize um, reduced uh, carbon concrete on the project. And we'll also be looking to use um, uh, energy efficient LED site lighting as well as interior lighting on the project. Uh, this is our proposed um, elevation study for building A. Uh, it has at the corner in the bottom left of the, the picture here, you can see uh, storefront entries that are pretty typical for, for buildings of this, this nature. Uh, some of our competitors are obviously doing those uh, in both uh, North Aurora and City of Aurora, so I'm sure you've seen a fair amount of it. This will be a precast uh, load-bearing structure uh, with metal deck and joists. Um, and uh, again, we've had on this facility, we have two unique storefronts planned, and then all the loading will occur in the rear. Um, there's 27 loading docks planned with two grade level drive in doors at the rear. This is building B, uh, very similar in nature. Uh, the one thing that you'll notice uh, at the top of the page is the four unique entry points. This will allow us to accommodate um, smaller users for this facility. So we'll have a pretty good potential mix of customers, allowing some of the maybe smaller, you know, down to 40,000 square foot users, um, whereas the bigger building can accommodate the, either a full building user or potentially a, a two tenant scenario, maybe a 60-40 split. Uh, this will have 17 docks and then two grade level doors as well in the rear. Um, again, precast structure with load bearing uh, joist and deck. Uh, I I'm sure we'll get into this a little more in detail. Um, this is what is currently in front of City of Aurora for their review and approval. Um, this is our proposed ingress and egress at Sullivan Road to what is currently uh, deemed Fairview, which will ultimately become a, a private access drive into our site. Um, we have planned for out of the roundabout to um, try and mitigate any sort of queuing coming out of the roundabout and potentially trying to turn left into our site. Uh, we have a planned uh, left turn lane to allow for uh, any sort of vehicular and truck traffic to queue there as they wait for any sort of opening in traffic to make that turn. Uh, we think the majority of truck traffic is likely going to come from 31 from the other direction. Uh, but one of the comments when we sat down with City of Aurora was to, to be conscious of uh, the roundabout and try and mitigate any sort of queuing coming out of the roundabout. Uh, we've, we're also constructing an extended turn lane so that we can pick up the, uh, the dental office just to our east as well. So if anyone's trying to turn into there, they will have the, the benefit of that turn lane as well. Um, in addition to the proposed offsite improvements that you're seeing here, as part of the uh, interagency agreement, where City of Aurora took um, authority over Sullivan Road. One of the items listed in that agreement was the consolidation of curb cuts along uh, Sullivan Road. We are going to be granting to the properties both to our east and our west um, cross access easements into our, our private drive north of the, uh, the center median so that in the future, if there is an attempt at lot consolidation or IBEW attempts to sell off that small sliver piece next to our access drive, they would have the benefit of, of ingressing and egressing off of our private drive. 
Um, we cannot force the, the current users to do that, but it, it provides the means and, and methods for that in the future. Um, so in the spirit of the uh, of that interagency agreement, we, we, we read into that and, and try to come up with some solutions um, for in the future with, uh, with Aurora's attempt to, to consolidate curb cuts in that area. We also, we've brought our civil engineer and our traffic consultant as well. If, we, if there's any sort of additional questions, I just kind of gave a, a high level overview there. But appreciate your, your time tonight and letting us present. Thank you. One second. All right, give me one second, please. All right. Yeah, so there are, um, associated with this development, there are four items for consideration that the plan commission uh, voted on, and also two that would come through a final ordinance with the village board. The first being a map amendment to rezone the property. Uh, the second being a special use uh, to establish the property as a PUD, our plan unit development, um, the subdivision plat for the entirety of the development, and then site plan approval. The first being the map amendment, which is to rezone the property. The property currently consists of property in the ER, um, Estate Rural District, also the B2 General Business District, as well as the OR Office Research District to the south there. Um, the ER district is actually sort of the default zoning district, which is provided to properties that are annexed to town. Uh, this, this property here is a little unique in the fact that it was actually uh, zoned A agricultural. Uh, I believe it was the, um, the greenhouse at one point. But when the 2013 zoning ordinance amendment changed the zoning districts, the agriculture district was actually removed. Um, so again, this did have an agricultural district zoning designation uh, for the majority of the lots. I think there are eight total. Six of them had the ER district. Um, however, those were default to the ER when the um, A district was uh, removed from the district. So what they're looking to do here is establish the property with the ORI uh, district, which allows uh, warehouses as a permitted use and maintaining the lot two um, with B2 general commercial district. So that way the actual property off of Smoke Tree Plaza uh, remains commercial. Again, the comprehensive plan supports the rezoning of the property, uh, not just with the future land use designation, but also to the um, actual designation is for office industrial on that property. And I did list seven scenarios um, in the staff report uh, that speak directly to the comprehensive plan. Um, allowing flexibility of the property and just taking into consideration the industrial context of the area. Um, you have dark container to the northwest and, you know, even further to the west in Aurora, you have um, industrial development. So, again, this sort of fits the mold in the comp plan for what they're looking to do with the site. The other request is the special use of the plan unit development. Because the property is of a certain size, the re it's required to be a plan unit development. Um, as part of that, too, um, they're looking to um, establish that prop property with the correct zoning designation. So it would be a, a, a plan unit development with the ORI zoning designation. Um, in this case too, there is one minor deviation associated with that uh, PUD. Uh, this is similar to what happened with the Opus development of the Valley Green Golf Course is the lot with requirement, uh, I believe it's 150 feet. The access point at uh, Sullivan Road is actually, would actually be uh, 115, 114 feet roughly in width. That's kind of a conservative uh, viewpoint on that, but um, considering the fact that the property is very wide, I'm at, uh, looking at 1,245 feet within the actual interior of the development. But again, just that area of the access uh, is where the actual width of the property is counted for the zoning district. So they would just be requesting the, the minor deviation at the entry point on Sullivan Road, uh, which currently is the Fairview Drive entry. 
And again, that property is only gonna accommodate drive out. There could not be any building built in that area. Just wanna provide this little context. Anytime with a special use or some places refer to them as conditional uses, uh, you can't establish conditions associated with the development of the property. I have, I think a total of 17 conditions associated with this development. Where these come from is just sort of a culmination of the years of uh, dealing with the warehouse development in town. Um, just sort of mitigating the any impacts the development could have on surrounding properties, um, you know, requiring the, any fencing that be done, the, the buffer fencing, like you mentioned earlier, being six feet adjacent to the residential area, um, any perimeter fencing being, you know, black, metallic, non-chain link construction, um, business activities being conducted within the side of the building itself, no outdoor storage. So these are, you know, fairly common, but the whole intent is to minimize the impact of the development. The plat of subdivision is to consolidate the eight lots into one, um, lot one being the entirety of the development, uh, roughly 29 acres, uh, lot two, uh, maintaining about 1.2 acres off of Smoke Tree Plaza. Uh, that would be the commercial use. Um, again, the overall development would be, the, the land you'll see is, you'll see different uh, measurements of acreage, you know, 28, 29 acres, but again, we would be vacating Fairview Drive. So it would no longer be a required village right of way. Um, but instead we a private drive connecting Sullivan Road to Smoke Tree Plaza in that case. Um, the site plan approval, being a new industrial development, it is required to go through the site plan approval process. This site plan, um, again, had been before the board a couple of times, uh, the community at the whole level. Um, it was well received then and it was the, the plan commission did recommend approval of the site plan. The, there were you know, months and years involved in the planning of this property. I think at first there was a large commercial warehouse development with one building central to the, to the actual property itself. Uh, the goal of dividing the buildings up and then having all the actual activity, the truck traffic and the loading docks interior to the site, uh, as Jess had mentioned too, is to keep sound attenuation within the site itself. Uh, so that way it's not being cast on to the surrounding properties. Um, Again, that was the sort of the impetus of the site plan approval, which is re required by code. And I think that um, we've come up with a, a site plan that has been working for everyone. I do want to backtrack here. Again, the entitlement process, the first step was the plan commission public hearing. Sorry if it's a little uh, legible there, but the plan commission in May did give actually a positive recommendation um, to the village board. There, we did have a couple residents show up. Uh, one resident was a local business owner, I believe, who owned property off of Sullivan Road. Their concern was more or less just the property itself um, and taking access on Sullivan Road. Their concern was actually just Sullivan Road in itself. So we had mentioned that we would pass on their comments with respect to uh, future, future maintenance and the intersection regarding this development with the city of Aurora, uh, which we've been keeping close tabs on with the developer. Um, the, obviously, we're at the community whole discussion. We did include a uh, draft beauty ordinance for tonight in the packet. Uh, pretty straightforward and it outlines everything we've discussed with respect to the request being uh, for the village board and also to the conditions of approval. Um, so any final site plans or any sort of traffic plans would become an exhibit to that PUD ordinance that would be brought back at a later meeting for final consideration. Um, so that's really all I have to go over at this point in time and uh, myself and the developer can take any questions you might have. I kind of like the idea. It looks like uh, to me, the developers put a lot of thought into it and as well as thoughtfulness about the impact it would have on the neighboring uh, entities, be it residential or business. So I'm kind of in favor of the whole idea overall, um, pending any specific details. There's a lot of details here in this particular project, but to me, it looks like one of the better ones we've uh, uh, entertained to develop uh, here in our village. So. I'm kind of like. I'm interested in the truck traffic. So Route 31 at Lovedale, that's a nightmare. Um, most of the time the, the traffic stacks from Lovedale Lane to Sullivan Road. I don't see how your trucks are gonna get out of there and then go northbound and get on the tollway. And then almost same way with Sullivan Road, you have that circle interchange. Sometimes the traffic stack from that circle interchange all the way to Route 31 on like a Friday afternoon or something. And I, I just, I mean, I like the idea of you developing the property, but I'm concerned about what you're gonna add to Route 31 there. So I suppose you have some traffic counts and numbers and trip generations and things. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Javier Milan. I'm a principal with KLOA Incorporated, and we conducted the traffic study for the proposed development. Uh, know the area very well and what you're talking about. We have seen it. We have done some work to the south as well as to the north. So we're, we're aware of those uh, congestion uh, issues that you, that you did mention. One of the things that we have to be uh, cognizant about it is that warehouses, the truck traffic generation, tends to occur, or the, the majority of it, outside of the peak hours. And I think one of the reasons for that, because we have talked to warehouse uh, operators, is time is money for them. So they try to avoid, I'm not saying that they don't generate in the morning or in the afternoon, but they try to avoid those issues that you see. So most of the truck traffic generation occurs from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. when traffic tends to be lower than during the seven to nine period or four to six. Uh, one of the other things, which is a positive of this, and somebody mentioned it, it's the fact of the two axis drives and also that solid mine also has a, an interchange when you go to Orchard, you know, so don't think that all of the traffic is gonna be on 31. There's more than one option to do this. Certainly the majority of the traffic is gonna be on 31 because it's the closest and quickest route to get to I-88. But again, the positive is the fact that this can spread the load over various routes. You have the number of trucks or? Yes, I do, certainly, and I can give that. Uh, based on uh, IT and IT is the Institute of uh, Transportation Engineers. Uh, this is the standard to uh, do the trip generation for trucks. Uh, so on a daily basis, the truck traffic would be, and I'm gonna use round numbers, 260. In the traffic study it says 258, so I'm rounding to 260 daily trips. So normally it's 50% in, 50% out. So you can take that number and that's what you would have. And like I said, the great majority of that number, it tends to occur between 11 and 3 p.m. During the morning period and the afternoon, there's traffic, tra uh, truck traffic but it's not as heavy as what you would see during those off-peak hours. And, and did you say that uh, you're gonna turn, or the truck drivers will turn right sometimes and go down Sullivan to the- No, no, no. <laughs> what I was saying, the plan is to direct the, the big trucks, the, the big semis, you know? Yeah to actually exit onto Sullivan because, and I know you're aware to try to, to go through there and make the turn and exit on the Cinemark, you know, it's not conducive, it's, it's very shallow. So that's why you saw the plan for the left turn lane, for the uh, inbound and outbound and, and the large radius. What I'm saying is if there is, as it was mentioned, a backup, you know, there's options. The direction is to actually exit onto Sullivan and travel to Route 31. And like I mentioned, that's gonna be the favorite route because it's the closest and quickest route to get to I-88. But if something ever happens, and I've always said this, you know, there should be more than one option. What if there's a blockage or an accident or something? There's other ways to get to I-88. And the semis should be able to get around the circle? The circle, when it was uh, designed, you know, and, and we have counts, there are semis that are doing that, you know, so, so the circle was designed to give elbow room to actually allow some semis to travel through there. I think the actual, I want to add too, is that the, that's actually a City of Aurora truck route. Sullivan Road is right in that area. Mike, can you go back to the, maybe the next slide? I'm just going to add a little bit of commentary to, to what Javier just said. So, Part of, part of the focus and the reason that we wanted to get the uh, the smoke tree access is if trucks do want to head westbound, um, they actually don't need to leave on the Fairview Drive access point. They can actually egress north on a smoke tree and use the route that DART does down Evergreen. Um, that is a good potential alternate solution for them to avoid uh, ever going through the roundabout. So they would head north uh, up to smoke tree, head west on the smoke tree, south onto Evergreen and they avoid it altogether. That'd be a preferred route. Yeah, so again, I think once you get, once these users get used to the facility and how and what makes sense. And again, I think another relief valve for vehicular traffic is getting up to Smoke Tree and coming out at Tinseltown because they have the ability to make those, those, those turns. Um, so I think that we were looking at that being that north uh, access onto Smoke Tree being kind of the relief valve for this site. 
so that we're not concentrating all of our traffic at Sullivan. So if I'm one of the folks in that office and it's I hear the 5 p.m. bell go off, I'm egressing to the north and coming out to a lit intersection. I'm not going to try and try and intermingle with with queued traffic. And I, I would assume that's that's how the, the rest would behave as well. Truck traffic has always been my concern with this plan before, um, but this is certainly a much better plan than, than before. I would agree. Much better plan than before. So I, I'm, I do like this plan a lot better than the last one. I'd be in favor. I think too, it's worth mentioning because that did come up. You know, obviously that was the impetus of the discussion last time was traffic and it is, it is North noting. I think he mentioned it in his uh, presentation, but there was a, a lot directly to the West of Fairview Dental they actually, as part of this development, were acquiring that lot and opening up the, the actual geometrics of the site, which the previous development did not do. So that's why you have a, a much larger entrance going into the property at this point. Are you, just to be clear, are you saying that the semis won't use, uh, go north and then uh, east on Smoke Tree and back around in front of the access I-88? Are you saying that? Because I can't see a semi being able to make that turn uh, off the smoke tree. Yeah, I, I, no, we're not, we're not. We're not anticipating the trucks trying to egress at the Tinseltown Cinemark. Yeah. I think that would be where it would it would be logical for vehicular traffic to, to egress at that point because they have a lit intersection. Um, that would just be an avoidance if if Sullivan was was busy at that time. Trucks should either be out on Sullivan directly east north on 31, or if they're going to be going westbound, if there's any sort of you know, industrial use that they're heading to, to the West, they would avoid the turnaround turnabout um, and they would egress the site to the North, head West on Smoke Tree, South on Evergreen. There is a stop sign at that intersection and then they can make a right turn. Right, I understand that, yes, thanks. So will they be using, just one more question. So will they be using the, um, as ingress off of 31 at Love, is it Lovedale? They will be able I've, to come I've, in there, but, but not I've easily. I've seen the DART folks do it, it's not pretty. <laughs> Okay. But it, it doesn't. It wouldn't make sense because the the geometry of for our site sure. ingress is the logical and hopefully with the, the the U.S. Postal Service and the house numbers, if you're going to map to that location, I would assume that that would be the logical. That that if I'm a over the road truck driver, that is not where I'm I'm heading. That's your not your preference to yeah, turn there. I mean, nobody's nobody can stop these people unfortunately from making poor decisions, but. Uh, the the logical ingress to our site would be south to thirty on thirty one Sullivan and then right, an, an easy right turn into our site because again we've sure. we picked up an additional seventy four feet of frontage on Sullivan in addition to the forty foot um, right away to allow for proper truck maneuvering to allow them to ingress into the site and since we do have such a large um, private drive into the site there will there will be no queuing. So the trucks will make an efficient turn mm -hmm. and not have to slow down or stop. And as you approach the uh, the turnabout, it's a, you're naturally uh, decelerating as you get to that, that location anyway. So it, it provides for a relatively easy maneuver for yeah. an over the road vehicle. And the last thing, solid money is a designated truck route. So like you mentioned, you know, people can do whatever they want, but the designated route, it's solid money. It's just a designated truck route. And did I understand you to say also that the turn lane that the trucks would use to get into your site will be extended for the dental office there to use as well? I think Correct. that's important so that people who are trying to get there, uh, you know, there's there's room for them and it's not going to congest that in a way Correct. that's going to uh, impact those people who are trying to get to that business. Correct. I like the idea. I like the idea of the, the landscaping and the retention ponds. I'm a person who just thinks retention ponds just make everything kind of a prettier and you know a, a much more aesthetically pleasing um, site. So I'm what I see here so far. I like. Yeah, and one thing on the the dental parcel, they are selling us a a portion. They're one of the four sellers, so they're they are amenable to to our adjacent use. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. I think you took a diff, difficult piece and you know came up with something pretty decent. Yeah, uh, all the I easy ones are done. Yeah, so we we brought a fun one for you all today. Yeah, so. So I think it's pretty favorable yeah. from the board. Thank you. So, yep, yep. thank you. Thank you. All right, item three, Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Item number three is uh, regarding a pavilion at Lippo Park that the Fox Valley Park District is looking to put in. Uh, 
Mike is actually just going to walk you through. It's uh, had some initial review from the staff and there were some thoughts that it might need some zoning and uh, some other approvals. But at this time, we're doing more research because we're not so sure it needs any approval. So with that, I would give it to Mike to go through. Everyone's uh, familiar with Little Park, just north of Red Oak Nature Center off Route 25. Okay. So the actual Lippo Park um, is, was annexed to the village in 2019. And when it was brought into the village, it was brought in under the default um, ER zoning district, as I had mentioned with the previous development, uh, has that sort of default status. Um, the park district is looking to um, put a educational pavilion uh, used for educational events and also special events, uh, which would be seasonal, I think would be from May to October uh, would be used. Um, when, when the property was annexed to the village, we did not establish an annexation agreement with the property. We just did straight zoning. Um, the, the pavilion itself meets the, the ER zoning district requirements, so there were no further considerations for zoning needed at this time. Um, the one item up for discussion is actual the use of septic and well for the property. Um, the property is not serviced with any close proximity with uh, sanitary sewers or village water main. Um, in fact, the area where the pavilion is looking to go was actually at one point in time in, in the general vicinity was a house in an archery range. And that, that archery range and house was actually serviced at one point in time uh, with the well and a septic field. Um, so what they're looking to do with the pavilion would be to utilize a septic field and also to uh, well water. I think I included some of that in the plans in the packet tonight. Um, so sort of giving the board an idea. The... So the actual use itself, again, is, is a park district land. There is not close proximation. We're just basically looking to get feedback from the village board on the use of the septic and well. Uh, there are two bathrooms that service the property. And again, I think the, it's not necessarily just for the pavilion itself, but to service the entire park and having those uh, public restrooms available. There's a couple of drinking fountains too, and maybe a mop sink um, included in the pavilion itself. There is no kitchen service. Um, this is not going to be a fully conditioned space. Again, it looks like it's going to be temporary from May to October. Um, when why we're having this discussion is the, the actual municipal code requires that uh, village any anyone looking to basically build or take occupants in the village has to use uh, village water and then village sanitary. But again, in this case, the actual closest available sanitary water is at the Lincoln Valley and the Fox development on the east side of Route 25. Um, and also, too, making it a little more challenging, getting away from just the general engineering and, and the, the grade elevations between the two sites. There's also the fact, too, that you have different two different major um, players with the state of well, Route 25 and also to the railroad a company having to work through that as well. Um, so we're looking to just get feedback on the use of something well for the actual property in itself. Again, just being for park use, um, no further buildings we plan at this point in time, just provide those amenities for park goers and, and the users of the pavilion. And the park district is here tonight if you have any further questions or if you, Jeff, you want to add anything. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> are, are there any uh, other plans of, I know Lippo Park and White Oak are kind of far apart, but is there any future plans to develop the middle part of that where it would make sense to run water and sewer? Well, see, I know that, I'm not sure, but Jeff could probably answer that, but Red Oak also too is actually served by septic and well. So I think anything would have to take access probably from the east side of 25. So well, the that's ordinance- a good question. There wouldn't be any other structures or anything that would, where you could see an incremental or there would be ability to maybe spread cost over a couple of projects. What makes this complicated is our subdivision ordinance is where the water code is and our the water requirement. And a lot of times those subdivision codes are, are for when you're actually building a development and you're essentially building new. So the assumption is you're going to be near the village's water system. Uh, plus, when it's done by annexation agreement, not straight zoning like we did when we annexed this property, you talk about those types of things in an annexation agreement on whether, you know, you can negotiate whether the village water system is needed or not. Now, to my knowledge, Red Oak probably existed before the ordinance took place. So that's why they're on well and septic. Uh, it, it was before, I think our ordinance took place in 2000, it got updated. Yeah, the actual, actual water is um, actually just governed, but that's not governed in the subdivision ordinance in this case. It's actually just the mutable code under public, under public services. And I make that distinction because 
the subdivision ordinance actually has processes for variances, meaning that either the staff or plan commission can recommend a variance to the village board. Uh, this being just a general municipal um, or, or code that um, there really is no clear path to definition as to what it is. Um, you know, having internal discussions, again, it's not a fully occupied building. Also too, is that I think there's inherent when you say it has to take service from village water and sewer that it's available to them. In this case, this is not a new subdivision. And quite frankly, there just is no sewer water available within reason to this property. So in the past, we've had one other property that I can think of where we came in and had to get permission from the village board for the use of um, a well on site for, and, and that was um, after someone had found a well to be advantageous for their production of their restaurant and whatnot. And it still goes through all the you know necessary uh, processes of making sure the well is safe for consumption. Um, that would be the same thing here. So Kevin and Mike are reviewing the water and really it's the issue of occupy um, occupancy because the idea is it's, it's not a full year round occupied building. So the question is, is it really a structure or is it a building? Like, and so that's what the argument is, it's, does it require potable water or is it just a structure? What are some of the things that are going to be the facility is going to be used for? Uh, that's a, that's a good question, and and really, what the the genesis of this is really to be able to fully um, address uh, our environmental education program, summer camps, classes, without permanent restrooms, water, and a shelter we find that a lot of groups don't come out or won't come out because of issues with weather. That's why it's three season and not heated or conditioned. Mm -hmm. It's really to, to provide that, that uh, those facilities for, uh, for those programs on a regular basis and summer camps as well. We've had to do temporary things with porta potties and whatever, but that still lim limits it to about 30. And there are always questions with, uh, um, weather and find that many field trips choose not to come when they find out that we don't have the ability to uh, have a roof if, if the weather turns bad. And then what type of special events do you anticipate, like parties and weddings? That could be, you know, it's, it's available for rentals. It would be uh, village events. Uh, yeah, any, any that would meet obviously our capacity and other right. restrictions. Um, I like the idea. I think it would be an improvement to that area. I, I just walked through there yesterday and I thought, oh, see, I'm going to have a firsthand view uh, for tomorrow night's meeting. So I, I think it would be a great improvement. I like the idea. I, I appreciate staff uh, recognizing the public aspect of the restrooms to along the, the bike path and having it be a, you know, serving as a trailhead actually rather than, Red Oak Nature Center, which has a limited amount of parking. So the restroom is a better destination or, or launching off point for a circuit rather than cluttering up the Red Oak. Um, and of course, all the, the benefits from that, uh, we're finding that quite a few people come from outside the area too, to enjoy the bike trails and, and the facilities here in the village. So um, would this, that parking area is, that's there now be redone also? It's looking a little that would be worn. part of, yeah, that's an old remnant when it was an old archery range and that used to host national tournaments. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm fine with it. I think it's kind of unreasonable to ask you anyway to go underneath the Federal Railroad on a yeah. state highway to get, I mean, that'd probably take you years to get. I was going to say, that. it might take three terms of all the yeah. <laughs> trustees before yeah. we'd be back here getting that uh, yeah. accomplished. Thanks, reasonable. If we determine there's any any additional um, approvals needed, um, you know, if any formal approvals, we'll be bringing back an order instead of at a future meeting, if, if that is necessary. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much. You. All right. Item four. Steve. I think item number four is revisions to our uh, current purchasing policy. Uh, this is a policy that we use on a highly regular basis. It, it, it governs um, spending authorities. It governs uh, the processes for purchasing. Uh, we update it periodically. Uh, with the issue that came up on the board agenda earlier tonight about bidding, it brought up 
we try to do this just like our HR manual. Whenever something comes up, it's a good time to open up the rest of the policy and see what else could be updated and changed. With the bidding issue, we looked at it and said, do we really want to tie back uh, to having to do publications in local papers if that's really not something that is required by state law anymore? And it's not something that is um, advantageous in a lot of the staff's opinion at times. So that being said, it opened up the door and uh, Jason has some amendments that we are going to discuss tonight. All right, thank you. Uh, so I just wanna go through kind of five areas uh, to focus on of, of where these changes. Uh, the first being uh, what came up earlier tonight with the bids in the newspapers. Uh, so going to the Min Illinois Municipal Code, um, they basically just say that we need to advertise for bids in a manner prescribed by ordinance. So then if you look at the village's <coughs> code, the code says that that's where we get to the newspaper, advertise at a local newspaper of circulation. Um, so what we're looking to do is update that to say that we're going to advertise bids publicly in keeping with the Illinois Municipal Code in a manner outlined by the village's purchasing policy. So we're not going to tie it to any one form. We're just going to say as, as uh, defined in the, per, uh, the purchasing policy. Um, so then in the purchasing policy, we also have reference to advertising a newspaper. So what we're looking to do is then update that to say, we're gonna advertise on the village's website, but then we can also include secondary options, which could be industry websites, newspapers, trade journals, IDOT bulletins, kind of however we feel we can get the best responses. So we don't wanna limit ourselves just to newspapers. We wanna kind of open it up and really tailor these bids to where we think we're gonna get the best responses. Um, the second area we wanted to look at was the village administrator spending authority. Um, currently, if you look at the purchasing policy, we have a 5,000 to 15, up to less than 15,000 the village administrator can approve. Then we have a 15,000, but less than 25,000, which requires <coughs> board approval. Then we have an over 25,000, which also requires board approval. So kind of what we're doing is we're getting rid of that 15 to up to 25,000 and just saying village administrator can do has to approve 5,000 up to 25,000. Um, both of those would still require us to get three bids. Uh, we can't split contracts. We'd still follow the exact same purchasing policy. It's just, if, if you look at our, our current purchasing policy as well, um, we say that anything over 25,000, um, we have to get the, the, we have to go out and get bids for the state uh, statute requires us to go out for anything over 25 for uh, public improvements, public works contracts, uh, purchasing su supplies. So we're just kind of getting rid of that, that middle area to where it kind of seems redundant in a way that, that we're requiring board approval for that. Um, we did a, uh, a survey of kind of some other communities. A lot of uh, ones around us are kind of also as well in the 25,000, 20,000. So we are a little low compared to some of our surrounding uh, communities. And we also went through, we looked at the last two years of how many contracts really fall within that 15 to 25,000. Um, fiscal year 22, I counted six, and then uh, 20, or 21, I counted four. So we're averaging about five the last two years of things that actually would fall within this, this 15 to less than 25,000 that we're talking about. Um, uh, the Jason, third, Jason how many fall between zero and, or let's say 5,000 and 15,000? I would have to go back and, and really look at that since, since those are kind of more the everyday. Yeah. I just approved two today. So like uh, two mean, a day, okay. Well, no, no, no. I just approved two today, right before the meeting for uh, John's department for um, a leaf box and uh, uh, something um, a lawnmower. And so typically, most expenses are under five thousand dollars. Like that's the average daily thing. Is you're buying something, and it's it's a little bit. Um, the department heads are good about bringing everything five to fifteen to me. Uh, there isn't a ton that's fifteen to twenty five. It's like Jason said, it's it, the reason the, the state law is 25,000, which is why a lot of towns go to 25, because anything beyond 25, if it's required to be bid by state law, it has to be bid. So well, as Jason said, this is more expeditiously. I am actually reviewing one expenditure that came in um, in the last week that's going to be just over 15. And it's one of those things where um, it's a company we've used for years at the police department for security reasons. They're looking to upgrade a system. I'll bring it to the board because I have to currently, um, but to me on paper, everything looks copacetic and in, in that it would be uh, something that I would have approved internally. Uh, so the third area that we're looking at is just really kind of updating some stuff in the bid process. Um, some of the things would be switching things that occur in the process from the village administrator to the finance department, which would be 
kind of reviewing bid documents before they go out or looking at bid tabulations. So we're really just kind of, you know, taking the purchasing, uh, uh, the procurement functions and kind of matching them up with the budget and the long-term planning, just making sure everything is really on, all on the same page uh, as part of the process. Um, the fourth area would be service contracts and professional services. Um, so what this would do is we added wording that would allow the village. So if we have uh, vendors, longstanding vendors, we have a really good relationship with, have a really good history with the village. Um, we would allow them, the village, to just continue going on with these rather than cons constantly going out for bid and, and going for, out for RFP or RFQ for these vendors. So just, you know, so this could be anything from, you know, financial um, vendors, uh, engineers, architects, anything like that, that we have a longstanding um, but we did have language in there that says any new contracts with new vendors that we have no history with, we'd still send them through the exact same uh, procurement process going out for bids, RFQ. So this would just only be for you know, people we have history for. We can just kind of continue going on with them if everything is good. Um, and then the last piece of it related to P cards, um, currently, or village credit cards, uh, currently in our process, we just say that you, uh, certain department heads, uh, you know, mayor, uh, or other supervisory employees can request uh, a, a purchasing card through the village up to $10,000. Um, but when you look at the actual practice of it, it's usually department heads have about a $10,000 and then kind of the supervisory employees of 5,000. So what we really wanna do is just kind of define, define actual practice in the, in the policy saying that department heads could request up to 10,000 and the other employees can request up to 5,000. We really just kind of put that in writing. So those are the changes that we're, um, we're, we're going to propose. I don't know if there's any other questions. I should have a credit card. It is the same practice though. So if uh, John's limits 10,000, if he makes a single expenditure over 5,000, he still notifies me. Uh, typically our practice is by email. Um, that's a, a lot of ways to do it. Sometimes someone might write me a memo and then I just let them know if that's acceptable before they make the purchase. I, I'm okay with the changes. The, the only thing, the only concern, and Steve, this, I, I love you. I trust you, but uh, uh, there is only five uh, issues or average of five per year between that 15 and 25,000. And I think part of the reason the village is in such good financial shape is because of the partnership between the board and staff that's gone on for so long. And uh, I kind of like to see I, when we have those as a board, because we're ultimately responsible um, to for that oversight. So that would be the only one where here. And if you if we were to get a new administrator, if you went someplace else and it's already in there. I mean, I, I like I said, I trust you, but. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at the code as a whole, and, and I, I think that um, I, I would feel more comfortable with anything over 15 coming to the board. Anybody else? I have a question on um, something in section four uh, with established uh, businesses that we do business with. Would that be uh, by circumventing the bid process? Would we? be subject then to the whims of their charging policy or uh, would we get a competitive bed? So here's, here's a good example. Um, we're currently looking at our cell phones. So we issue cell phones to several employees um, throughout the village, uh, police department, public works, village hall employees. Um, and if you add the totality of our, of our bills each month, it ends up being right at my current 15,000 or, or actually it's, it's more than it right now. But the idea of switching cell phone providers every year for our whatever it is, 20 or 30 phones that we have and, and you know, for saving possibly five bucks or whatever here and there, it, it's there's lots of processes like our cable bills and stuff like that that would be the same thing, our telecommunication things for Internet and whatnot. We'd have to always constantly bring them back when you're talking about like someone's going to give you a better deal one year for a hundred dollars off. And then next year I have to go back to another provider for to get that hundred dollar savings there. and it's easier to just make sure everyone's got the same cell phones that are working and we keep working with our vendors to make sure the prices are acceptable. Uh, uh, that's kind of what the service, uh, another example of the service providers we use long-term are people who handle things like accounting and, and does our payroll. That was a, a thing that we have a company that does our payroll for us because it's cheaper to do it out than it is to have someone <laughs> do it in. So that 
firm does it annually. Typically, these are under my spending authority. Uh, what we were saying is, at what point does it become board approval? And, and that's the thing. So even if it's $7,000 a year, there's some ambiguity on, okay, but if it's a five-year contract, is it 7,000 times five years? Or is it every year it's 7,000 and we're approving it as an expense going forward for the year? So this just clarifies that on those, we have a lot of different you know, companies that we use on a regular basis that are nominal amounts. But if you add them up in the totality over years, the dollar amount looks much larger. Thank you, Steve. So the change would be that there would not be board approval necessary until it got to the $25,000 limit or uh, Right, so what it would be is it's the authority of the administrator for the year. So if, for instance, we change vendors on something and it's gonna be, um, you know, for this in terms of purposes, we're talking about 25,000. So we say we're gonna switch cell phone providers and the new provider's contract is their estimated bill for the year is gonna be $26,000. That's still something that we would go back to the board and let you know how we got to that. Then moving forward, essentially, once the board approves that, unless something changes egregiously, you would just keep that contract moving forward. Steve, let me address uh, uh, Trustee Carroll's comments and concerns a, a little bit. <laughs> Let's say um, uh, tomorrow you're offered a $700,000 a year job right down the street from where you live. It's an ideal situation for you and we don't have you anymore. And we bring in somebody who's a scoundrel. Would he be able to take advantage of that? I think is a concern that- so, uh, so, and, and, and it really doesn't matter to me. The board, I mean, you're the board. If you want me to be at 15,000, that's fine. Um, the reason that it was even brought up and we, we hemmed and hawed on whether to bring it to the board. When we looked at the, we did a survey, a quick survey. And I, and Jason, I think there were seven towns in this area that we, we often compare ourselves to. <coughs> Two had it at 20,000 and five had it at 25. And the reason for that is because most towns, or at least the towns in Syria, they tend to just follow state law. So when the authority for the bid requirement it used to be 20,000, it went to 25, which is why some towns are probably still at 20. When I got here, we were at 10. So it's just, yes, it doesn't come up often that I have to go back to the board, uh, but there was just something I approved for water uh, yesterday, um, yesterday on the weekend, but so I approved something yesterday and it was one of those things where the estimate from the service contractor was going to be 12 to 15,000. So I had to make sure that John and the water superintendent knew that that contract cannot exceed 15,000 because what ends up happening is we had it happen once last year. You expect something to be under 15, the minute it crossed over 15, then we had to go back to subsequent board approval to be like, Hey, we already spent this money. We didn't expect to, but now we're here. So I think with the price, the way things are going up, it was just one of those things where I feel like that 15 to 25 range is going to see more action. I, I think what we're really trying to address is long-term risk. In other words, as the village progresses and we're all gone from here, other individuals will come in and be running the village, uh, including an administrator. And I think that's my, my question in follow-up of Trustee Carroll's concerns is uh, if we allow for a $25,000 limit uh, instead of the 15,000, would that give somebody uh, an ability to um, cheat, I guess, or uh, misuse it in some sure, way? Sure, sure. And, no, and I, I, I guess I'm asking your professional opinion. Can you see any <coughs> downside to doing this in terms of risk long-term? So, like I said, it doesn't matter to me if the board wants to keep me at 15, but Jason is also a checks and balance because as the finance director, I mean, he knows our procurement practices. And if he sees something that's a red flag, I think he would, you know, raise that issue to me. But, and go ahead. But he may not be here. That's what I'm saying. That's true. And of, the, of course, the, the catch-all is also the bill listing. I mean, the village board gets a listing of every expenditure that we do. So if you saw something that was a, a large dollar amount, didn't make sense to you, hey, where did this come from? You know, that's where the accountability ultimately lies was every board meeting, it gets approved by the board. I, I personally do not have a problem with it. I think that as time goes on, what 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 was fifteen thousand will be twenty five thousand because things are just that much more expensive, and it all becomes relative as time goes by. Yep. And you have a finance director who, like you say, you work in tandem with. Plus, every board member here gets an exact listing of everything that is spent. Um, and so, me personally, I don't have a problem with raising it to twenty five thousand. 
Can I, uh, can I just address the, the bill listing that that's true, but it's after the fact. So, and if you look at this in conjunction with the service contract, you could commit us presumably to a 10 year service contract at $25,000 a year. That's a $250,000 liability against the village that we may not agree with. Well, that I think is different. If you're talking about a contract that's long-term and it's $25,000 a year, to me, that's not a $25,000 expenditure because you're, you're, but, but that's you're engaging in a proposing. contract that's going to be long-term. If you're talking about an expense, that's, that's 25,000. To me, that's one thing. If you're signing on, if you're committing the village to a contract, that's going to be long-term, but it's going to add up to much more over a period of years. To me, that's something different. So there's actually a provision in the purchasing policy now that talks about multi-year contracts. And historically, when there is a multi-year contract uh, that I'm entering into, and I give you an example, um, I wanna say when we switched over to Metronet a few years ago for our phone system and, and everything here, um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the dollar amount was, but it was gonna be a multi-year contract. And I don't think it was, it might've been under my authority annually, but I still brought it to the board because it was a multi-year contract. The issue with the service contract, it's hard to explain, but sometimes this could be uh, an ongoing expense. Like a lot of times it really is. It's not as many as it's probably sounding. It's mostly like things like the cable bills or, or whatnot, the, the Metronet bills or whatnot that come in. And it's the ability of having to do this comprehensive uh, switch over of all of our telecom or cell phones or something for that. That's uh, it's the pennies are nominal and not worth necessarily the switch over of something that we know is reliable already. Uh, to save a few dollars. I, you know, Jason, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, service contract wise, like the payroll company that we use, we've been using for a long time. And they're, I think they're about 10 grand a year, six to 10 grand a year. Do, does the purchase policy require you to bring that or you're just doing that because you're you? So <laughs> I, because you're diligent. Yes. And I appreciate that. And yes, I think what ends up happening is I take a much more conservative approach to the purchasing policy and anything that's gray, I take to the board almost guaranteed. And, and that's, that would be my concern is that we are not all going to be here forever. And, and I think the, 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 my concern is, I mean, we've seen this in Chicago where they committed them to the, what was it? The red light cameras or the, or the, uh, but there's a difference when you're, when you're doing it by contract. And I think that's the difference. If you're signing a contract that's multi-year, that's different than hiring a service that isn't necessarily by contract. It's just, um, I don't know, like when, I guess when you get a cell phone, it is a contract. But Right. If it was month to month, it'd be one thing. But at any yeah, sort like of term. We can leave the payroll company at any time. We don't have to use that payroll company. We choose to because they have all of our information that have been overseeing our you know, payroll for a long time. And they know all of our processes and whatnot. Now, that being said, doesn't mean we couldn't find another payroll company tomorrow, but that one doesn't, that's not by contract. That's just an ongoing service agreement. Right? So can I liken that to my, you know, I sign up for Metronet and I say, okay, for the first year, I'm going to pay so much. And then two or three years down the line, it's going to go up. But if I decide in 18 months, I don't want to use them anymore. I'm not locked into that. And I can just go to somewhere else as opposed to a written contract that the village has, has signed onto. Am I getting that difference? Correct. Well, they're both contracts. One's just a month to month. The other one is, is a term contract for a, whatever period of time. Yeah, that's a big difference because we can get out of the month to month whenever we want to. Here, I, I, and again, I, it, right now, status quo, uh, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, you having purchasing power. power. Uh, I think, though, if we're going to change the policy, we should do it in anticipation that of our because if we do have a new administrator and the board's caught off guard, what's to stop that new ad administrator from obligating the village to a 10 year contract okay. at twenty five thousand dollars? Can we change year? that in the purchasing policy so that that doesn't happen versus a one time purchase of something up to twenty thousand or twenty five thousand? I think that's two different issues here. That they don't. So under service contracts in our current purchasing policy, this is what it says right now. From time to time, the village enters into contracts for services for ongoing maintenance of village facilities. For instance, that, that was a good example. We use, a lot of times we use the same companies to maintain our HVAC 
they're not on contract, but they know our system. So we'll hire them multiple times a year. <coughs> One year, it might be $3,000 worth of an expenditure. Next year, it could be 8,000, depending on how many times we call them out. But we tend to call the same companies to service things because they have the history of knowing all of the things and they, they know how to fix it. So the procurement of bids or quotes for these contracts should follow normal procurement procedures based on the estimated annual value of the contract. That's already currently in our, in our code or in our uh, purchasing policy. The village will entertain contracts for multiple years if it is determined that it is in the best interest of the village and would be served by entering into a multi-year agreement. The village administrator will determine if a multi-year service contract should require village board approval, even if the annual cost of the contract is less than the annual normal uh, required for village board approval. So what ends up happening is if we have a nominal fee where it's not really a contract, it's HVAC and it's a couple thousand dollars a year, I'll sign off on those as they come and John hires the company to go out there and fix something in a pinch. But when I know that there's something that's, let's say, 10 grand, it's less than my spending authority. But if I know it's a four-year commitment to the village and it's going to be 40 grand, I've historically taken that to the board. But do you have to? It's, that's well, the question. I mean, it currently says that it, it says the village administrator will determine if a multi-year contract should require village board approval, I, I think even if the annual the contract question. is less than the yeah. amount. It's just historically we have done that. But I get your point. I, I, do you have any advice on all this? I mean, it's, you know, it's the board's prerogative. Um, you know, basically, the purchasing policy is a delegation from the board to staff. Um, you know, those decisions lie with the board as a general proposition, but the board can delegate and statute puts limits on what the board can delegate. Um, so, you know, ultimately the prerogative lies with the board. So, uh, in other words, uh, you're just <coughs> upping at $10,000, your ability to purchase without board approval. Is that what you're saying? And so, in other words, a, a future individual that might want to misuse the system uh, would only be liable for $10,000 before um, the board could, in other words, to address Mark's, um, one of his comments was um, after the, the bill payment, <coughs> the bill listing is given to us a, afterward, after the fact, but then even then any future board could still then respond um, if they didn't like something that they saw in that bill listing uh, in terms of disciplinary action or corrective action of some kind. So I guess I don't really have a problem with the changes myself uh, as long as you're here. <laughs> right. I, I get the, you know, having read that out loud again, it, it kind of does, I understand the point Trustee Carroll's making. When you, when you say service contract and it, it almost like, or services, I should say, and you're, and you're bringing up a multi-year contract as currently written, it is, it is confusing because like, it could say if there's a three-year contract and each year is $5,010, multiply that by three, it's just over 15,000, you know? Now, me, I would take that to board because to me, that would be three years, $15,030. But, but I get that, like in the grand scheme of life, $5,000 uh, based on, you know, our, our budget of, of $13 million in the general fund, um, is that $10 really gonna put you over that limit each year to bring it to a board approval? So I, I get that it's the, you're trying to protect and it's hard. We write these policies all the time and we follow them because we know the policies, but it is, I mean, unless you're actually sitting here every day at every, and we have, look at the bills list. The bills list is huge. You know, with the amount of vendors we use everything, there are very few contracts that actually come to the village on a regular basis. Most of it, it's straight purchases, which follow these procurement practices or they're board approved uh, bids, um, budget, right? Or budget yeah, they're in the budget yeah. and their nominal dollar amounts like, oh, you know, tree trimming today was $4,000. We have $20,000 in the budget. We got, um, Steve, I got a couple quotes. Here's the company. And that's, that's the normal, that's what most expenditures are. It's, hey, the purchasing policy requires me to get three quotes. Steve, here are my three quotes. Or John, it's under $5,000. Here are my quotes. Okay, Brian, here you go. You're good to go. And that's that's most of the purchases. Yeah, I, and, and then I, how about we meet in the middle and just put a, a limitation on the number of years you can agree to a service contract without board approval. So limit it to like three years. There, there's, there's some contracts by uh, code, by statute, 
that can't exceed the mayor's term in office. And I'll be darned if I can remember the rules that apply to, to that, which contracts those are. But I mean, I suppose that could be a, uh, maybe that, that would be the limit because there's already kind of a concept along those lines. And for instance, there are some contracts that this board can't burden a future board with. Right. Right. They can only extend right. as far as the, the current board, which right. is tied into the mayor's term. That's kind mm -hmm. of the idea behind the, that limitation. Well, then, the, with that also, caveat, I'm, I'm, I'm fine yeah. with that. I think 15,000 is too low any, anyway, nowadays. I mean, it doesn't take much to rack that up. And um, <laughs> plus it also expedites the process, right? I mean, I mean if you have an issue come up, once again, it doesn't come up often, but I, I do feel like eventually, as, as Trustee Selzer said, that at some point, you know, as things yeah, are getting more expensive, I think we're just getting closer to things that used to cost seven or eight thousand or now right. ten thousand. But, but to clarify, I think we're and and I'm going to be 100% honest with this purchasing policy, where even the staff gets tripped up sometimes, is the difference between a service contract and a professional service. And so, if you look in our policy, the changes are really designated in professional services. And that's where it's not necessarily that we're looking to change anything with our contract, the way that we procure a, a contract. It's the way for ongoing services where we have, let's say like the payroll. Um, yeah, we can get a new payroll company and try them out, but then we have to start from scratch after, you know, and, and for a company that, you know, we're only paying a few thousand dollars a year, do we want to try new companies all the time to save a few bucks when we know that the company doing it is, you know, has all of her knowledge well, doing it well. Isn't professional services in that limited to legal and financial accounting? No, it, it, the 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 statute that that uh, mentions professional services um, it, it extends beyond that. Uh, it, it extends to services that require a particular expertise. You kind of are trusting the expertise of the provider. You know, not janitorial, but engineering or yeah. yeah. Legal. Yeah, and, and more. Right. So we're still required by purchasing policy. We are still required anytime we, we start with a new architect or engineer that we go through the RFQ process to actually procure, you know, pick out the most qualified engineering firms. Once you establish the relationship with the engineers and the architects, um, you're allowed to use them. However, once again, the contract amount is still delegated by the purchasing policy. So case in point, we're probably gonna be back at the next meeting with an agreement with EEI. EEI does, we, you know, we vetted them, we've used them on projects before. Once you've used them either through the, or, or once you've gone through an RFQ or if you use them for a, a project that's underneath that dollar amount that's required for the RFQ and you've established that relationship, you can just bring back the contracts to the board if they exceed my authority. So like, for it's the lead service line replacement program that they'll be um, working on. That's going to be well above my spending authority. It's going to be like $80,000. That'll come back to the board because even though we have a relationship with them, it exceeds my spending authority. If I, if you want, and I'm just throwing this out there for the board because I don't want anybody to be, and, and I, even I've confused myself at points tonight. So I want to make sure that we are 100% clear on what delegates a service and professional service. I have no problem coming back again and having Jason and I come up with maybe some examples that better explain that section. Yeah, let's do that. You want to do that? If, if that's up to the board. If you want, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Okay. We can all think about it. Just kind of show you. It's like yeah. an electronic amusement device. What's a yeah, claw right. game and right. what's not? All right, that's that. Um, need a motion to adjourn the exec session for discussion of sale of village property. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Same thing. Okay. We won't be meeting afterwards.